is it bad that I can't tell the difference between a cold welcome and a warm one? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, good morning, Prescott Valley Park Collective. We are so glad that you're with us. It is chilly today. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy holiday season. Wherever we are now, we're in this weird like... You know, we're in the holiday season. It's not Christmas. It's not Thanksgiving. So happy holidays, I guess, right? Um, or maybe we should call it happy Hallmark season. Maybe that works. Uh, but uh, one fan. Cool. Uh, Hallmark's doing well. So, um, but welcome to you. We're glad you're there. Prescott, um, it is good to see you. Well done. Well done. It, it was cold today. And you battled it. And you're here. So well done. Good job. Give yourselves a high five. Yeah. Um, that was about as good as your cold welcome. So there you go. Uh, but uh, it, it's fun, right? This time of year is full of traditions and, and hopefully you got to enjoy some of those with people you love and people that are near and dear to you. And um, hopefully you got some good food. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting with my older kiddos, uh, we did Black Friday, right? But that was back when Black Friday was still fun. You know what I mean? Like midnight, the stores were opening and like humans turned into animals. You remember to get that TV? And, and I would go honestly, just because it was a study in humanity, it was this amazing thing watching what humans would do to each other for a TV. Uh, and so um, my littles this year, you know, the stores were opening at six. So I'm like, the night before, I'm like, I'm going to wake you up at 530 if you're good with it and we're going to go. And, and uh, we go out and I get them up and, you know, it's the whole blurry eye and we're out and whatever. And and uh, we get done. And and my 12 year old goes, um, it was about an hour later. Are we going Black Friday shopping next year? I hope we're going. And I was like, yes, score one to dad. Building traditions. Let's go. Um, I'll take a win wherever I can find them. So uh, but whatever your traditions are. Um, I hope you got to enjoy them, and uh, we're just glad we get to do this as a family. Uh, as Austin said, we're in Advent, and if you're not familiar with church, uh, if you're not familiar with church calendar, you might go, Advent, what is Advent, right? And, and so Advent is just this time of the year in the church calendar. It's not unique to heights in any way, shape, or form. It's part of church history where we really just lean um, into and, and take literal, so, so the, the idea of arrival, right, is what Advent holds. That's what the meaning of the word holds, this, this arrival. You're anticipating the arrival of. And obviously where we sit in history, we're not anticipating the arrival of Jesus for the first time. We're anticipating that Jesus is returning. You know he's returning, right? You know that today. Jesus is coming back. That's not up for debate, right? And so this idea behind Advent is that we're preparing ourselves and we're looking forward to the anticipation, just like he did here, he will do again. And so this idea that we're looking forward, but we're also in the Christmas season where we celebrate the arrival of. And so part of Advent for our church family is we can get lost in this season real easy. It can be easy to get distracted by too many things, too many traditions, um, all the trimmings of Christmas and get to Christmas Day and completely miss what Christmas Day is for. And, and so the goal is over the next weeks as we work towards Christmas, we're preparing our hearts as a church family. We're leaning in. Uh, if you've been with us, you know there are four words that we're going to work through. We're going to work through love one week, joy another week, hope and peace, right? We're, we're, as a church, we work through these words and, and we look at the scriptures and we encourage our hearts from it. Today, we land on love. And in our teaching prep meeting, one of the things that came out of that was this, this idea Pastor Todd was saying. He goes, you know, I'm really seeing a connection between love and how love really impacts joy, hope and peace. And so today we're going to kick off with love, knowing that it's going to impact the weeks to come. And, and so with that, um, the idea of love, I was asking that same team, I was like, hey, what are some characteristics you see of God and how does this show up in your life now? And, and again, it was Pastor Todd that was going, you know, I kind of have to look in the rearview mirror, to be honest with you. I have to look and see where I've been with God and see what God has done to be able to really capture the characteristics and the elements of love in my life. And I would say the same, like if you think about it, like if you ask me today, hey, John, does Cindy love you, right? Cindy's my wife, for those of you that don't know, does Cindy love you? And I would tell you yes. 
But if I was to explain the characteristics of Cindy's love for me, I would go back all the way through our history, right? And at this point, we're coming up on 28 years, we've got a little bit of history. There's a, quite a few moments that I can take you to and go, man, when I, when I wasn't well, right? If we just go to the vows, right? For, for rich or poor, there are times when we've been very, very in a space where we're like, we don't know if we're gonna eat. And she stood by me. And there are times when we've known what we're gonna eat and we feel spoiled. And she stood by me because her love wasn't determined by what we had or didn't have, right? She, she's proved that over the years. The, the idea of in sickness and in health. There are times when I've seen that girl sit by my bed and pray for me because I was in a state that wasn't healthy. I was super sick. And so I can take you back to these moments and go, I've seen her love show up. I've seen her take care of me. Because let's face it, right? Men were babies when we get sick, right? Right? We were babies. We need help. And so I'm whining and complaining and she's stepping in and loving and taking care of and, and, and nursing me back to health. And I think we sometimes, this idea of a rear view mirror that we look back to go, oh, there are the characteristics of love. And I think with God, it's no different. And I think John in, in first or in John chapter one, John chapter one, when he's capturing this this narrative of what we call Christmas, right? The, the, the way he captures it, he first takes us backwards. And in John one, one, it says this in the beginning, in the beginning was the word. Um, you could substitute the, the name Jesus for the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So, so, so where does John take us to to explain what's happening within the Christmas story? He takes us all the way back to the beginning. And he goes, Jesus, right? Jesus, you need to understand that, that everything is created in creation through him. Uh, Colossians talks about that it was created by him and for him, that all things exist for Jesus. And so then he goes a step further then in verse 14, and he says, the word Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So, so he says, this Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling where? With humanity, with us. The, the, the God's been moving towards this moment, that this moment is monumental in God's character. That when we look at the character and the nature of God, especially through the lens of love, this moment is monumental. That God put on flesh and blood. And in the Message Bible, it says that God put on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Isn't that beautiful? That God moved into your neighborhood. He moved into the neighborhood of humanity. Why? Because he was motivated by love. And this idea of looking in the rearview mirror, we got to catch what God's been up to. We got to catch why this moment is such a massive moment in the history of God and his character. Because if you go all the way back to the beginning, if you go all the way to creation, right? God creates this perfect space. He creates this perfect environment and he gives everything that's needed out of love. He provides everything humans will need to flourish. He provides everything that humans will need to be sustained. He provides everything they need, puts them in a space, puts them in the garden. And we know those humans walk away, right? And God, in chapter three of Genesis, so the first book of the Bible, chapter three, God makes a promise. And that promise, he's actually talking to his enemy. He's talking to Satan and he goes, hey, you think you're going to win. I'm going to crush you. Right. And so he from that moment, God sits on a mission of redemption. From that moment, God sits on a mission of love. Right. The whole thing he's been building out of love. And now he makes a promise out of love. And what's the promise? A redeemer is coming. One who is going to make things right is coming. You move forward in the story. Right. And he makes a promise to a man named Abraham. 
Abraham didn't even have the right name. God had to change his name. That's how much Abraham had to do with it. Abraham had nothing to do with it. God comes to him and he goes, hey, Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless the entire world. Every single person will be blessed through you, Abraham. Every person that's ever born will be blessed through you. And then the story moves forward, right? Abraham begins to move out and he begins to have families. A couple of generations later, um, you, you get to this moment where God now makes a promise to a group of people that are, that are slaves. And he comes to a guy named Moses and he says, hey, Moses, I'm going to keep my promise to Abraham. And the way I'm going to keep that promise to Abraham is it's through you. And you're going to go and you're going to set this group of people free. And they're going to be my people. And they are going to be a blessing to the world. But catch this, Moses, I'm going to give them land. And so Moses then goes, right, under the promise of God. Why? Because God's always been moving forward. God's always been moving with us. And so out of love, he makes this promise to Moses. He moves close. He rescues them. Next thing you catch is Joshua shows up. And God makes a promise to Joshua that you will inherit the land that I've been promising, that you will establish a nation. And and so now they move into this land. They take the land as God said. Why? Because God's been faithful. He's been keeping a promise. But you see, the promise to Joshua is built on a promise way back here. The promise to Joshua is built on this promise that, hey, there's a redeemer coming. That through this person, through this nation, I'm going to bless everybody. And then once that nation's established, he begins to make more promises that there's this person called the Messiah coming. The savior of the world is coming and God continues to make promises. Why? Because he's building on what he's doing back here and out of love, he's moving forward. And he begins to promise them, hey, a Messiah is coming. And then there's this moment in John, right, where where God himself moves into the neighborhood. And what God's doing is fulfilling his promise from way back here. That he's stepping in and he's each step of the way, he's been faithful and he hasn't failed. Each step of the way, his plan hasn't been thwarted or moved or broken. But God in his strength and his steadfastness has kept going and moving forward to the point where John goes, I got to tell you how I see it. That creator God, he showed up and moved into your home. He's dwelling. That word dwelling is to to be at home. Where is he at home? He's at home with us. Now, now the Psalms had a way of trying to capture this whole thing of what God was doing. And they they use a word in Psalms 147 and verse 10. It says this, his pleasure, so God's pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, which would have been the weapon of the day, right? It's not in the strength of the horse, nor is his delight, nor is his pleasure in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope, and here's how they explain this whole thing, in his unfailing love. So so they capture everything that God's been doing, his faithfulness, his steadfastness, all of that, right? They they capture his loyalty to this promise. They capture it in this, this, this wording of unfailing love. And in fact, so much so that this word in the original Hebrew shows up approximately about 250 times. You think God wants us to get a message? That this unfailing love shows up 250 times. Because he's trying to get us to capture, hey, what I've been doing here is who I am. And it carries forward. And then in Psalm 143, another example is in verse 8, so a page backward. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. There it is again. For I have put my trust in you. Show me the way to go, the way I should go. For to you I entrust my life. What the psalmist is saying is it's this unfailing love that allows me to trust. Now, now the original word for unfailing love in in Hebrew is hesed. Okay, so everybody, it's just fun to say. Look at your neighbor and just go hesed. There you go. Okay, three of you. Great. Eight o'clock. We can do better. I have faith in you. Okay, I, I believe. I really do. Okay, so, so, but here's the idea, right? That when it comes to this word hesed, there are characteristics to it. I don't know if you know this, but English is not a rich language. 
right? Speak to somebody that speaks a different language and they're like, yeah, English, it's really not that rich, right? The, and when you get into the original language of scripture, one word, we have to use many words to describe that word. And so sometimes you'll see it translated as mercy. Sometimes you'll see it translated as unfailing love. Sometimes you'll see it translated as loving kindness. Sometimes you'll see it um, translated in, in various ways that have to do with loyalty, like a loyal love. But this idea of hesed, there are three characteristics I want you to get from this. That hesed, the hesed of God is strong, it is steadfast, and it is love in its purest sense. So it is strong, it is steadfast, right? Strong meaning it's not lacking in strength at all. Steadfast, it will not give up, it will stay the course. And love from the standpoint of this purity of love, right? That, that it's caring, it's loving, it's kindness, it's gracious. All of those things, those components make up this word hesed. And all of that is what the psalmist is going, hey, what God has been doing for all of history. Don't miss it. It's his unfailing love that has been driving it forward. It's his unfailing love that kept the promise over and over and over. It's his unfailing love that will not give up. You know this, right? God can't fail. You know why? Because God is love. God is hesed. God is strong. He is steadfast and he is love. It is not only his character, it is his nature. It is who he is. You know that God can't fail on one single promise he's made to you. Because his love, his love is unfailing. It's loyal. It's steadfast. It's mercy. It's grace. And he's been moving for all of human history forward to move into the neighborhood of us. Do we see that God really loves us? I mean, do you catch today how much you matter to God Almighty? That God, for all of human history, is moving this thing forward. I want to show you, they're, 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 it's amazing how God puts messages together, you guys. Because sometimes I'm just like, God, I know I'm supposed to teach on this word. I know I'm supposed to do this. And, and then like this week, I had an interview. And I sit down for the interview and something strange happens at first. The gentleman goes, can I have the first two minutes? I'm like, sure. He said, two years ago, you asked a rhetorical question. And God has been working on me to answer that rhetorical question. And he goes, he led me to a book by Martin Smith. And he goes, I just for two years have wanted to give you this book. And this week he gave me that book. And wouldn't you know it, there's an entire chapter in there on this word. Isn't it cool how God works? But in there, he uses an example, and it's from the life of Joshua, of how this has said works. How the loyal, unfailing love of God works. It's an example of it, right? And in Joshua chapter 8 and in Joshua chapter 9, there's a moment, they're in the land, they're taking the land, right? They're clearing out the land. And there's a group of people that show up to Joshua. And when they get there, like their sandals are all worn out, right? And they, their, their clothes are all, all worn out and old. And they take out their food and they, it's all dried out and moldy. And they're like, Joshua, we've come from such a long, dis, long journey from a distant country, and he, he goes, uh, we're here to make a treaty with you. And Joshua looks at them and he looks at their clothes and looks at their food and goes, man, you, you guys have been on the road for a long time. And so Joshua, without consulting God, makes a treaty with the Gibeonites. And as he makes a treaty with the Gibeonites, three days later, he discovers that they actually live just over the ridge. That this whole thing was a ruse that they made their clothes old, they made their sandals beat up, they molded their food to trick the Israelites into making a promise, a covenant with them. And so now the Israelites and the Gibeonites are in this, and Joshua finds out. Now, if, 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 if it's me, at that point, I'm like, you trick me, our contract is null and void, right? We're avoiding this thing. But Joshua doesn't do that. Because Joshua is a representative of the God who what? Keeps his promises. Why? Because the love of God, the unfailing love of God, right? And Joshua is now living that out as a representative of God. And so he says to them, well, you can become our servants. 
To which the Gibeonites are like, dead or be a servant, we're in, right? And so they become servants of, of Joshua and, and the Israelites. Well, wouldn't you know it, the Canaanites, they get a little worked up over it. And so the Canaanites brothers band together and they're like, we're going to come and destroy the Gibeonites for what they've done, right? Because they should have stood with us against the Israelites. So the Canaanites now are going to attack the Gibeonites. And guess what? The Gibeonites come to Joshua and they're like, hey, so we're in contract together, right? You're going to defend us. So which again, I would go, no, our contract is null and void at this point. We're not going to suffer loss for you. But Joshua goes to God and you know what God does? God says, uphold the promise. Go and fight for them and you'll defeat all of the Canaanites. Because that's how loyal love works. That's how this hesed works. I, uh, you think about it for a second. The Gibeonites, what had they done? They lied, tricked their way in. They weren't good in their, in their morals. Uh, anybody relate? <laughs> and God goes, no, we're still going to defend them. Guy, ca catch this. Because at the end of the story, there's this miracle that outside of the resurrection might be one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. Because the battle is taking place. And Joshua tells the sun to stand still. And the sun stands still for an entire day so that God can keep his promise. Why? Because when Joshua made the promise, he was making a promise on behalf of the God he was in covenant with. And that God now stood and goes, no, we don't give up on covenants. We will hold what we have said is true. Why? Because my love is loyal and I will not give up even if I have to make the sun stand still for an entire day. And it's this beautiful moment where we get to see God's loyal love. You, like, like, think about this for a second. We look in the rear view mirror to see the character in nature. You know what the problem is with humanity today? We have 25 year olds that are looking in the rear view mirror and God didn't show up in my 25th year. And I'm like, I'm done. Can we please look at the entire history of God before we say we're done? Because the entire history of God screams that he has been faithful over and over and over, that he cannot fail and his love will not fail. It's fascinating in Psalm 147, in verse 11, we read this already. I want you to catch up. The Lord, the Lord delights. The Lord delights. Can I, can I be real honest with you for a second? One of the journeys I'm on personally as, forget Pastor John, just human John, who's in relationship with Jesus, just like you. My, my counselor has me working on accepting that God delights in me. Because can I be honest with you? I, I sat with her and I go, I don't understand why I can't accept that God delights, that he takes pleasure in his son. So when I read these words, the Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope, who put their hope, the Lord delights in those who have a correct view of who God is, right? His, his extreme love, and they have an on respect for God. The Lord takes pleasure in that. And then the Lord takes pleasure, right? When we put our hope in his unfailing love. When, when, when you put your hope, your trust in the unfailing nature of God, you look at his history and you go, man, you've kept it the whole time. You, you look at who he is. You look at what he's done. You look at the moment when he shows up and moves into the neighborhood. Do you, do you realize that you today can bring pleasure to creator God by standing firm in your hope and your trust in his hesed? It's that easy. It's that easy. 
Oh, he's, he's, he's not looking at you and going, well, I'm displeased because you cussed four times today, son. Well, I'm displeased in you because, well, you went to church and you, you didn't raise your hands in worship. Well, I'm displeased today because fill in the blank. He's not saying that. What delights the heart of God is humans that go, my hope, my trust is in that you will show up the way you have always shown up. That even in the midst of this, I can trust you. Uh, there's a story in Mark chapter four. In Mark chapter four, if you've been around church, you're familiar with it. If not, we'll catch you up. That day, verse 35, Mark 4, 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Don't you love the details of the Bible, by the way? He's just asleep. Oh, by the way, he had a cushion. That's how much he wanted to sleep. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? What do what are they asking him? Don't, don't you love us? Hey, hey, Jesus, do you, don't, don't you care? I mean, can you, can you imagine God becoming human and sleeping on a cushion in an uncomfortable boat and you're going to ask God, hey, you must really not care. He got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. That is your God, by the way. He controls the wind and the storm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You, you heard that, right? Jesus, Jesus didn't ask them, man, what is wrong with you guys? I thought you guys were fishermen. You've been on these waters before. You can't even navigate a little storm with your little boat. He doesn't say that. That's, that's, that's not where he goes. Oh, come on, you guys. You couldn't just speak to the storm and bring it under control. What's wrong with you guys? Uh, a little storm, you, you, how'd you end up here in the first place? You must have done something wrong. Jesus doesn't go to any of those places with them. Because what delights the heart of God is faith from people who put their hope in his unfailing love. And where he goes with them is he goes to where? Their faith. Did, don't you have faith? A little storm can throw you off an entire history of God moving towards you to tell you he loves you. A little storm is going to shake my hope. Here's what I love about this word has said, okay? Because if God is has said, here's what I want you to catch. It means that he'll be there tomorrow. And it means that you'll be there the next day and the next day and the next day. And it means on the day that you need it most, God's unfailing love is going to show up because that's who he is. And that is only who he can be. So on the day when you realize I'm a sinner and I need a savior, he was on a cross. On the day when you go to your last breath and you're going, man, I really hope that the unfailing love shows up on the other side. You need to know the unfailing love of God will be on the other side for you because that's who he is. Hey, which church, do we catch it yet? That according to John, God himself put on flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Why? To tell you, you are loved. That you can bring pleasure 
to the creator God by just going, my hope is in that love. My hope is in the unfailing love of God. Oh, church, how he loves you. How he loves you. How he loves you. Do we get it yet? Because if you're anything like me, it takes a while to get to my heart. How he loves you. God Almighty, who is unfailing love, who is loyal in his love, who is strong in his love, who is steadfast in his love, who will not be shaken in his love, who will not be thrown off track in his love. He loves you right here, right now. It's beautiful. There's a song we've sang for, for a while, if you've been around church. And the writer of the song was trying to capture the, emo the emotion in the moment of God showing up. The, the, this moment when God puts on skin and moves into the neighborhood. And he has, he's painting pen, the words of this song. He has the imagery to capture. And again, we're capturing emotion in words, right? He has the imagery. And he's declaring how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And one of the lines that he puts on this thing is, is so heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. To which the church was like, it's too much. <laughs> and so we called it an unforeseen kiss, which is weird because that's like creeper status. <laughs> but it made us feel better. But the, the, the idea of the sloppy wet kiss as he was writing it, he had his kid in mind, his little toddler. You ever get a kiss from a toddler? It's just sloppy and wet and they're like, oh, I just love you. And that's what he was trying to capture when he was writing down about how much God loves us. That it's like that toddler that comes and just like, oh, I just love you. And just lays it on you. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, church, I don't know about you. I'm ready to sing. So I'm going to pray and shut up, and we're going to sing. God, we can, well, you don't have to say, man, I'm going to shut up, but <laughs> thanks. God, we come before you. You are our creator. You are our sustainer. God, we are so grateful for what you do, what you have done. We're so grateful that your track record of Hesed, of loving us, is strong and it's steadfast and it will not give up. That your love is pure and it shows up in grace and mercy that you lavish on us. God, if your grace is an ocean, we are sinking today. It is so deep and so rich. And so we just say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for grace. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for his said. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for not failing. Thank you that you cannot fail. Thank you that you are strong. Thank you that you are steadfast. Thank you, God, today that you love us. Would we not leave this room without recognizing that we, we bring pleasure to you. You delight in our hope in your unfailing love. Thank you for loving us. And everybody said, amen.